بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين All praise and thanks belongs to Allah سبحانه وتعالى and may the peace and blessing of Allah be upon his servant and final messenger Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم As to what follows my dear respected brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته First and foremost, we say Alhamdulillah that Allah Azza wa Jal has extended our lives to give us yet another chance to witness the first 10 days of this sacred blessed month of Dhul Hijjah. For we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the ability that we worship Him the way He deserves to be worshipped. My brothers and sisters in Islam, these are 10 days. And they are the most rewarding days of the entire year and the best days of the entire year. And there are so many good deeds that a person can do, so many good deeds a person can do. But we need to prioritize and understand what is important and what we're supposed to focus on and what we're supposed to give much of our attention to. And if there is one deed that we're supposed to give full attention to, it is our obligations. Wallahi, my brothers and sisters in Islam, nothing will bring you close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala other than the obligations. And the best deeds to be done during these 10 days and outside these 10 days would always and forever be the obligations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said in the authentic hadith, and this is uh, a hadith Qudsi. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said this, وَمَا تَقَرَّبَ إِلَيَّ عَبْدِي بِشَيْءٍ أَحَبَّ إِلَيَّ مِمَّ افْتَرَطُّهُ عَلَيْهِ Allah azza wa jal said, there is nothing, nothing that will bring you close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like the obligations that Allah Azza wa Jal commanded us to do. This is the thing that will earn you the closeness to Allah and the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And everything else would be secondary. Everything else is nawafil. And everything else is mustahab, liked and permissible to do. So we need to focus on our obligations. And one of the main obligations, and this is the greatest obligation, after a tawheed after one embraces the tawheed embraces la ilaha illallah the oneness of allah azza wa jal the greatest of the obligations is as salat the prayer we need to focus on the obligation of as salat especially now during these 10 days and wallahi my brothers and sisters in islam not everyone who performs the actions of the prayer is considered someone who prayed. I and mean, there was a man in the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who prayed. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told him, Irji' fa salli fa innaka lam tusalli. This is a companion that prayed in the masjid of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And after his prayer, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told him, get up and pray again because you did not pray. So not everyone who performs the actions of the prayer, doing this and ruku'ah and sujood and coming up and down, not everyone who does the actions of the prayer is considered someone who prayed. So we need to focus and we need to pay attention. How are we supposed to enhance our salat and perfect our salat so that Allah Azza wa Jal accepts it and so that we can see its reward in this life and on, and on the day of judgment. My brothers and sisters in Islam, when the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam described his relationship with as-salat in a beautiful hadith, he said, حُبِّبَ إِلَيَّ مِن دُنْيَاكُمْ أَطِّيبُ وَالنِّسَاءِ وَجُعِلَتْ قُرَّةُ عَيْنِي فِي الصَّلَاةِ Allahu Akbar. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, two things in this worldly life I love, and that is perfume and woman. This is what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam loves of worldly matters. Perfume, because it smells nice, 
it has a beautiful smell to it, and it pleases those that are around you, and it opens their heart to you, as opposed to someone having a bad smell. For Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam loved perfume. And from this worldly life, he loved women. He loved women, al ulama rahimahumullah, said, because women, when the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam married these women, and he had so many wives, they are the ones who would narrate to us his private life, how Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam slept, how he woke up, how he prayed at night, how he performed ghusl, how he performed his shower, and all these matters that happen inside the house, who's going to narrate that to us? Woman. For Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam loved woman and he loved marriage because what is meant by woman here is marriage. He loved marriage because these women later on would relate to the entire ummah, the private affairs of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and how he lived as a husband in the house. And there are so many ahadith narrated by the wives of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in where we learn so much about our deen. For these are two matters he loved. Notice he used the word hubbiba. I love from this world perfume and woman, meaning marriage. Then the hadith went up a level when Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, وَجُعِلَتْ قُرَّةُ عَيْنِي فِي الصَّلَاةِ جُعِلَتْ قُرَّةُ عَيْنِي فِي الصَّلَاةِ And the delight of my eyes, the coolness of my eyes, the happiness of my eyes was in the prayer. Now, you see, حُبِّبَ الحب is one level, to love something. But if you want to express that you love something يعني more than just the concept of love, the other word for this is قُرَّةُ عَيْن In other words, mahabba or حُب is one level. وَقُرَّةُ عَيْن is a level higher than love. قُرَّةُ عَيْن العلماء رحمهم الله They said that when your heart and your eyes are filled with the love of something, so much so that you do not look for anything to replace that thing. That is what قُرَّةُ عَيْن is. So when the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says that the prayer was his قُرَّةُ عَيْن which is a level higher than the natural love, this is the nth degree of loving something, when he says that, he means that I will not replace a salat for anything else. You know, children have been described in the Quran as قُرَّةُ عَيْن. The uh, Musa alayhi salam was described for his mother Qurratu Ain. Uh, Isa alayhi salam was described for his mother Maryam Qurratu Ain. Kay taqarra aynuha wa la tahzan wa qarri ayna. Children, Allah azza wa jalli says, Rabbana hablana min azwajina wa dhurriyatina qurrata a'yun. Why? Because you will not replace your children with anything else. These are your children. These are your Qurratu Ain. Your happiness and the delight and the coolness of your eyes when you see your children. So Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as-salat was his qurratu ayn. In other words, you give him the world, he will not replace it with as-salat. Nothing can replace as-salat. This is the level that we want to reach. How can we reach a level that no matter what was offered to us, we will never accept it in replacement for as-salat. Today, so many people have replaced as-salat with materialistic matter. Right? If he has Jumu'ah, uh, Salat al Jumu'ah, people miss al Jumu'ah because of a worldly job, because of some money, because of some job that might pay him a thousand or two thousand dollars. He missed Salat al Jumu'ah because of some materialistic manner. Such a person, as Salat, hasn't been Qurratu Ain in his life. For as Salat to be Qurratu Ain in your life, the delight and the coolness and the happiness of your heart and your eye meaning you will not replace it for anything. No matter even if the entire world was given to you, you will never replace it. This is Qurratu Ain. Is it possible we can reach such a level? Yes, of course. Of course we can reach such a level. So listen, bi'ithnillahi ta'ala, and I'm going to share these points with you. And as I mentioned in the description, the lesson is going to take long. Yeah, yeah, yani, uh, be patient with me. If you cannot, then bi'ithnillah, I'll put the recording up and you can hear it later on. My brothers and sisters in Islam, as-salat 
is the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is one of the greatest rights that belongs to Allah azza wa jal. In a hadith, a woman came to the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And she said to him that her mother had died and she still had one month owing of fasting. And her mother, she still had one month for Ramadan. She did not fast. So she came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said, Ya Rasulullah, my mother died and she still has one month of Ramadan. She did not fast. anha. Can I fast this month on her behalf? So when Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said to her, and listen to this, he said, لو كان على أمك دين أكنت قا قاضي قاضيته قضيته If your mother was in debt and she owed someone money, would you have went and paid it on her behalf? So this woman said, Yes, I would have paid it on her behalf. فالنبي صلى الله عليه وسلم said, فدين الله أحق أن يقضى. He said that the debt that is owed to Allah deserves more attention, deserves more attention than if your mother was to owe someone something from this worldly life. Yani the debt of Allah is more important than the debt of people. So as though Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is telling her, of course, go and fast this month of Ramadan on behalf of your mother that she did not fast because this is the debt of Allah. If you are going to pay back the people money money that your mother owed, then most definitely go and pay the debt that is owed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and fast those days on her behalf. So what we learn from this hadith is that the prayer is a right of Allah azza wa jal. The worships that Allah azza wa jal obligated upon us and commanded us to do, they are the rights of Allah azza wa jal. And we must show concern with the rights of Allah azza wa jal and we must pay them in full and worship Allah Azza wa Jal the way He commanded us to do so. Allahu Akbar. And as I said to you, my brothers and sisters in Islam, people today are missing Salat al Jumu'ah. People are missing Salat al Fajr. People are not praying Salat al Isha because of work, because of worldly matters, because of a party, because of a, a, a gathering or an invitation. And they stay up long hours of the night. And then when He gets back home, Allahu Akbar, salat al-Isha, salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah, and then go to sleep. Allah, Allahu Akbar. What is this? We need to change this kind of behavior and attitude to as-salat. This is wrong. We must respect the rights of Allah Azza wa Jal and make them one, number one in our life. After that, your worldly matters come. Number one is the obligations. Then worldly matters come. Uh, you can look after that after after you have achieved or uh, fulfilled the rights of Allah Azza wa Jal. My brothers and sisters in Islam, the prayer is the right of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. It is Imadu Din, as Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam described it. He said in the Hadith, "Amuduhu as Salat," that the foundation of this Deen of our religion is as Salat. This is the foundation. You know, if a house, if you remove the foundations of a house, the house would collapse. So in other words, if you remove the prayers from your life and you don't show concern in your prayers, you know what happens as a result? Your entire iman would collapse. Your relationship with Allah would collapse. For this is the first thing that teaches us the importance of salat in the life of a believer. That it is amud din It's the pillar and the foundation of the religion. It is the first thing in the first matter that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will question us about on the day of judgment. Allahu Akbar. The hadith goes on to say that if the salat was correct and perfect and there was concern concerning the prayer, then all the deeds you did are all correct and perfect. All the deeds that you're going to do now in the 10 days of the Hijjah, we are sadaqat, Quran, Tasbih, Allahu Akbar, Subhanallah, and the, the goodness that you do, all of this is depending on your salat. If your salat is given a tick on the day of judgment, everything else you did, bi'ithnillah, is accepted, and it's all good. And if your salat was a big cross, fa'in fasadat, 
if his prayer was corrupt and it was neglected and you showed no concern towards it, everything else you did is gone to ruin. Everything else is gone to ruin and it is of no benefit. Allahu Akbar. How after you hear this hadith can a person neglect his salat and focus on other things? Prioritize my brothers and sisters in Islam and use these 10 days of the hijjah to learn your salat and to perfect your salat. Yalla, you have 10 days. You have now 8 days ahead of you as a, a short training course to perfect a salat so that after this, you're able to pray يعني, in, in, a, in a good fashion, in a manner that Allah deserves. So it is the first thing that we are judged about on the day of judgment. Uh, also, it is آخر ما وصى به رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم it is the last matter that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam advised his ummah before his death. Just before he died, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, As-salat, as-salat. As-salat meaning commit to the prayers, commit to the prayers. And he said it twice, meaning he emphasized it and this shows its importance. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he praised those who pray, he praised them in the Quran. Allah Azza wa Jalla, he said about Ismail alayhi salam, وَكَانَ يَأْمُرُ أَهْلَهُ بِالصَّلَاةِ وَالزَّكَاةِ وَكَانَ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِ مَرْضِيًّا That Ismail alayhi salam, he used to instruct his family to pray and to give zakat. As a result, Allah Azza wa Jalla was pleased with him. Allahu Akbar, he earned the pleasure of Allah because he would instruct his family to pray. And he used to commit to the prayers. As a result, he earned the pleasure of Allah Azza wa Jal. Isn't this the purpose of life? Isn't this what we want in life? To earn the pleasure of Allah Azza wa Jal? There's the path, as salat. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said in the authentic hadith, رحم الله رجلا قام من الليل فصلى وأيقظ أهله May Allah have mercy upon a man who woke up at night and prayed. Then he went to his wife and he woke her up. And if she did not wake up, he sprayed water onto her face. And may Allah have mercy on a woman who wakes up at night and prays and wakes her husband up. And if he does not wake up, she sprinkles water on his face. The, these people earned Allah's mercy because of their concern for as salat this is their concern for a sunnah prayer, which is the night prayer. And they earned Allah's mercy for a nafil prayer that they showed concern in. Imagine then how much of Allah's mercy would they earn when they would show concern in their obligatory prayer. Allahu Akbar, my brothers and sisters in Islam, the more concern you show the sunnah prayers and the night prayers, this helps you in developing concern for your obligatory prayers. And what proves the importance of a salat also, <clears throat> this is an introduction, that Allah Azza wa Jal disgraced the one who abandons and neglects a salat. Allah Azza wa Jal, he says, فَخَلَفَ مِن بَعْدِهِمْ خَلْفٌ أَضَاعُوا الصَّلَاةِ Allah spoke about people who lost interest in the prayer and they abandoned the prayer completely and they would pray whenever they feel like. They would delay these prayers and pray them at the end of their time, outside their time. Allah Azza wa said about them, وَاتَّبَعُوا shahwat." As a result, they followed their desires. They were tested with their desires. Wallahi, there is no one on earth that abandons the prayer except that he becomes weak towards his desires. He cannot control himself. He becomes weak and he submits to his desires and he follows a shaytan because these are two paths. It's either the path of Allah and you stick firm on it or you're going to be led to the path of a shaytan. There's nothing in the middle. There is nothing in the middle at all. It is either this or this. For Allah Azza wa Jal disgraced the one who neglected the prayer. And this shows how much Allah Azza wa Jal loves this prayer that he disgraced the one who abandoned it. It shows us the concern that a believer is supposed to have for this salat. What was the result of these people that abandoned the prayers? فَسَوْفَ يَلْقَوْنَ غَيَّةً They'll be thrown in غَيْ They will come in contact with غَيْ 
غي is a name uh, of one of the levels in the hellfire. والعياذ بالله. My brothers and sisters in Islam, the greatest pillar of Islam is الصلات. As Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the hadith, بني الإسلام على خمس شهادة أن لا إله إلا الله وأن محمد الرسول الله وإقام الصلاة. إقام الصلاة that Islam was built upon the oneness of Allah Azza wa Jal and to accept the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as being the Prophet of Allah and then إقام الصلاة to establish the prayer. Also, what proves the importance of a salat is that Allah Azza wa Jal at the beginning He obligated these prayers 50 prayers. They were 50 prayers at the beginning. You know what that means? This is this proves the love Allah has for us salat. That Allah initially wanted us to pray 50 prayers. This is the love Allah has for salat. And this is how much Allah loves to see us standing in salat. Allah loves to see us standing in salat. So the first command was 50 prayers. Heck, my servants, stand up between my hands 50 times in the day and in the night and pray. But then out of mercy of Allah Azza wa Jal, he reduced it from 50 to 5 prayers and he still gave us the reward of 50 prayers. Allahu Akbar. And then we have people that do not see the mercy of Allah Azza wa Jal in this hadith. Rather, they took advantage of this and they neglected 5 prayers. When in initially it was 50 prayers. That's Allah's love for us salat that he made it 50 times a day. There is nothing in our deen that we are commanded to do like a salat. Nothing at all that we repeat every single day and every single night like a salat. Can you imagine this? Ramadan is once a year. Zakat is once a year. That's if you can afford it. Hajj is once a lifetime. Inna salat was supposed to be 50 times a day. But by the mercy of Allah, it was reduced to five. And we were rewarded 50. For this proves the love Allah has for us salat. My brothers and sisters in Islam, also, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala listed in Surah Al-Mu'minun the qualities of the successful people, the first quality he mentioned, he said, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ The first quality of the successful believers was that they have khushu' in their salat. Yani not, not the first quality wasn't those who pray. No, pray, that's, that's, that's a matter that's closed. Of course, every believer is supposed to pray. The first quality was that they have khushu' in their salat. Their salat is a qurratu ayn for them. They have reached excellence in their salat. They cannot live without their salat. That is the first quality of the believer. Before, before giving zakat, before anything. How can we neglect this? How can we delay our salat after we hear this hadith? How can we not show concern in our salat? How can we still rush our prayers when we know this is the first quality of successful believers. Not people that pray, because that's a given. You're supposed to be praying as a believer. Don't you dare give yourself the chance or the option, should I pray, should I not pray? Rather, the first quality was they have khushu' in their salat. And this takes training and exercise. Bi'idhnillah, you get there. But listen to the lessons. Learn how to pray correctly. How to make this salat qurratu ayn bi'idhnillah he will get there. And then uh, the last of the qualities of the successful people in that same passage of Surah Al-Mu'minun, Allah Azza wa Jal said, وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ عَلَىٰ صَلَوَاتِهِمْ يُحَافِظُونَ And those who are, the, who safeguard their prayers, they safeguard them. They don't let any salat slip away from them. They're always careful and conscious and cognizant about their prayers. And they pray every prayer on its time. This was, so yani, the first quality of successful believers and the last quality was something related to as-salat. Allahu Akbar. 
And from the importance of a salat is that Allah Azza wa Jal commanded the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to instruct his followers and his family to adhere to the prayer. Allah Azza wa Jal said, وَأْمُرْ أَهْلَكَ بِالصَّلَاةِ وَاسْطَبِرْ عَلَيْهَا Allah Azza wa Jal commanded the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and told him, pray and command and instruct your family to pray. Allahu Akbar. And finally, or two more points I share with you on the importance of a salat. And that is that Allah and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam commanded the one who slept through the prayer or forgot about the prayer to pray it as soon as he remembers it. That's how important it is. That even if you slept by accident, let's say, and you slept through Salat al-Fajr, or you slept through Salat al-Isha, or whatever it is, then as soon as you wake up, as soon as you open your eyes and you remember a Salat, get up, make wudu, and run to the prayer. Doesn't this hadith prove how important Salat is? That even the one who slept through the prayer or forgot it, he's being commanded to get up and pray it as soon as he remembers it. Not, khalas, don't worry, it's gone. Yalla, wait for the next prayer. You know, unlike the other pillars, like look, for example, al-hajj. Look at the hajj, for example. If you miss the hajj, khalas, yalla, wait for next year. Amma salat, no. Don't wait for the next salat. If you forgot it by accident, get up and pray it as soon as you remember it. And finally, what proves the importance of a salat is that it never, ever drops in any any circumstance whatsoever never drops yani in comparison to all the other pillars of islam they might not be for you for example zakat it's not for everyone zakat is not for everyone zakat is for people who have money you pay zakat and other people will take your zakat other people will take the zakat you know Fasting Ramadan is not for everyone. If there's an old man, an old woman, or someone that is terminally ill with a chronic illness and he cannot fast, then khalas, fasting drops. He doesn't have to fast. Feeds a poor person for every day and that's it. Hajj is not for everyone. It's only for the person who can afford it financially and is in physical health and is able to do hajj. Otherwise, hajj is not required on your behalf. But look at as salat whether you're sick, you still pray, sitting down, lying down. Whether you're traveling, pray. Whether you're in residence, pray. Whether uh, you're on the battlefield, there's a salat. If you're on the battlefield, it's called salatul khawf. The prayer of the of, 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 of al khawf. Pray it even one rak'ah. Pray. Pray. If you're on the battlefield, and there is intense fee. Allah Azza wa Jal commands the believers to pray as they're running. Rijalan, as you're walking, pray. Awrukbana, on your horses and pray on your horse. It does not drop in any circumstance. Whether you're sick, whether you're in extreme fee, whether you're on the battlefield, your life is about to, your, your life is at risk, you're about to die. Don't abandon a salat. And, and that even. Yani Allah Azza wa Jal commands the believers to pray in congregation. Salat al khawf is Allah taught it in the Quran how it's prayed in congregation. Imagine that if there was one reason to abandon the congregation prayer, you'd think it's Salat al khawf when you're on the battlefield. Yet on the battlefield, your, your life is at risk. Pray it in jama'ah. How can people then neglect al jama'ah and the congregation for the men specifically? Yani? Even if it's raining. No matter what case it is, you pray. Even if there's no water, make tayammum and pray. Even if there's no dirt, let's say and you're stuck in a prison cell and there is no dirt whatsoever. There's no water, there is absolutely nothing. Pray in the way you are. Ya Ammi, Wallahi al-ulama rahimahumullah explain this in detail. Even if you don't have clothes on, let's say someone's stuck in a prison cell and they removed his clothes, has no water, has no turab, dirt to make tayammum. Pray the way you are. If you don't know the qibla, pray in any direction. I mean, give me one instant in Islam 
where prayer is cancelled in uh, يعني, uh, concerning a specific individual other than if a woman was to have her uh, periods or an insane man that has lost his mind these people they're not يعني, responsible for as salat and they're not accountable for it was a concession from Allah but other than that when does, where would the prayer drop it never drops for this is enough my brothers and sisters in Islam enough to teach us the importance of the prayer and why we're supposed to make it our main focus in life and oh Allah my brothers and sisters in Islam I did not want to start with the six points until I gave this introduction of about half an hour so that now when you understand the status of as salat in Islam the position of the prayer in Islam you will now pay attention to what I will give you of six points. So forgive me for this bit of a long introduction, but now bi idhnillahi ta'ala, we're going to enter and discuss these six points that wallah and by Allah. If these six points, you continuously realize them and recognize them and feel them in your heart and in your mind and in your soul before every salat, Uqsimu billah, wallahi, it is going to enhance your salat in a way that you have never ever experienced ever. And bi idhnillah, you've given yourself the opportunity to reach ihsan, excellence in salat, and you've given yourself a chance for as salat to be qurratu aynika, for the prayer to be the coolness and the delight and the happiness of your eye. Just like it was for our Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Qurratu Ain meaning you will reach the level in where you will fall in love with this prayer so much so that you will not replace it with anything in this life, no matter how valuable this materialistic matter was. Allahu Akbar. Let's mention these points. Write them down, put them on a paper, write point form and summarize. And then make a nice paper and keep it with you and recall them before every salat. If you do that for about a week, two weeks, you will memorize them and you will know that if you ever get distracted in salat for one second, you immediately remember these points and it will straighten up your attention and your focus in a salat. Number one, and that is mashhadul ikhlas, the feeling of sincerity. Allahu Akbar. The feeling of sincerity. That when you pray, you are praying with sincerity, which means that you are seeking your reward only from Allah and no one else. And you will develop sincerity in your heart and you will strengthen it when you pray alone, when no one is watching you. This is how you're going to develop sincerity in your heart. Pray at night. Pray sunnah prayers in a room where no one sees you. And that way you're going to develop sincerity. Sincerity means that you are praying and you only want your reward from Allah. You want recognition and appreciation from Allah. You want Allah to praise you and you want to earn Allah's love. You are not, you don't want people's words. You are not after the people's praise. You don't want the people's appreciation. You don't want the people's reward. You don't care about what people say. Ikhlas is, I don't care what people say. I only care what Allah, how Allah will see me after my prayer. That's what I care about. This is ikhlas. And the way you're going to develop it, pray a lot in seclusion, in private. This is how you will develop. And every deed we do in Islam must be sincere. Wallahi, without sincerity, your deed is gone to waste. This is why this is the first feeling that you're supposed to have in your heart. My brothers and sisters in Islam, this ikhlas, yani, let me speak about certain situations. Firstly, if you pray with sincerity, meaning as soon as you say Allahu Akbar, and before that, as soon as you begin your prayer, in your heart, you should feel that this prayer is only for Allah, and I do not want anyone's appreciation and anyone's reward, only Allah's reward. This is ikhlas. If, if midway through your prayer, 
you begin to feel a sense of ostentation or showing off. If you feel that midway in your prayer and you fight this feeling, you fight this feeling by reminding yourself that this salat is only for Allah and no one else, then your prayer is correct. Alhamdulillah, that showing off that came midway through your prayer does not affect your prayer whatsoever. The other situation is, if you began your salat with showing off, your prayer is nullified and cancelled altogether. Your prayer is cancelled and nullified altogether. For this is what we need to understand. Sincerity is the first feeling you're supposed to have. The second, uh, you know, and why I mention this, because there are some people that pray in the presence of others, just so others can say, look, this person prays. MashaAllah, look how long his prayer is. Look how perfect his prayer is. I wish I can pray like him. And he loves to hear these words. If you're a person like this and you love to hear these words, you have lost sincerity. But if people praised you for your salat after you have finished, and you did not look for that, and you did not care about what people say, you didn't even want to hear that, then you are sincere bi'ithnillah. So long as you keep up a fight in your heart and you begin to suppress a riya and trying to hide it and trying to destroy it in your heart, then your salat is good. And this is exactly what sincerity is. طيب. Number two, to reach the level of ihsan in salat and qurratu ayn. Mashhadu al-sidq. Mashhadu al-sidq. That you must be honest. In your salat, the feeling of honesty must live in your heart when you pray. What does that mean? How do we achieve honesty in our salat? My brothers and sisters in Islam, simple words. I give you simple words, Wallah, and I want you, I want you to uh, be aware of what I'm saying uh, and write these notes down and feel them in your salat. And tell me later on, tell me later on how your salat has improved, if it's improved or not. So we can follow up these lessons with a second lesson. Mashhad al-Sidq, the feeling of honesty in your heart when you come to pray. Simply what this means is that your outward appearance, your outward appearance must match your inward appearance as well. I'll give you an example. Yani, when you say Allahu Akbar, which means Allah is greater. It's not a complete sentence. Allahu Akbar is not a complete sentence. You have to complete it. Allahu Akbar means Allah is greater. Dot, dot, dot. Now you fill in the, the blank. Allah is greater than everything he created. Allah Azza wa Jal is greater than your worries. Allah is greater than all your distractions. Allah is greater than all your problems. This is what it means. So honesty is for you to say Allahu Akbar. That's what your tongue said. This is what you said from your heart, Allahu Akbar. But is your outside appearance uh, matching this statement? In other words, do you really believe Allah is bigger than your problems? And Allah is bigger than everything you own? Because if you really believe that, you will not rush your prayer. You will not rush. If you believed Allah is greater, you will not rush your prayer. Why? Because whatever you're rushing to, Allah is greater than it. So how can you be saying Allahu Akbar and then you rush your prayer because of something you think is important? Even now here, you're not being honest in your salat. You're Allahu Akbar that you said, you're not being honest with it. Similarly, when you raise your hands, this movement of raising the hand it symbolizes many things. One of the things it symbolizes is surrender. You know how when someone surrenders, they raise their hand, they've given up? This is your surrendering to the commands of Allah Azza wa Jal before you start your prayer. You're surrendering. Now, and remember, as in the hadith, Sayyidul Istighfar, part of Sayyidul Istighfar, we say, وَأَنَا عَلَىٰ عَهْدِكَ وَوَعْدِكَ مَسْتَطَعْتْ Oh Allah, I am doing my best. To fulfill the ahd that is between me and you, the agreement that's between me and you. I'm doing my best to fulfill this agreement. What's this agreement? Worshipping Allah. 
Right? So when you raise your hand, you're surrendering to Allah Azza wa Jal. You're surrendering. Allahu Akbar. Tayyib. If you rush your prayer and you're running to something else, then you're really not surrendering to Allah Azza wa Jal. Or if you're rushing your prayer so that you can run to a desire or a temptation or something that is haram, you have not surrendered to Allah Azza wa Jal. As a result, you have not achieved honesty in your salat. Ya khwani, my brothers and sisters in Islam, understand this, let's understand it together. Honesty in salat, meaning what you say and what you do, must match the inward and the outward, must match together. When you look down, Allahu Akbar, then you look down. This looking down symbolizes humility, that you're standing before Allah. How dare you just look up like this? Put your head down. This is humility. You're praying to Allah, be humble. طيب. Uh, and then you need to be humble, honest. This, this, is, this is your outward action and it needs to match your inward. Yani your outward appearance with your head down and your eyes to the ground, your outward appearance seems to be humble. But inside, are you humble inside? Is your heart filled with humility or it's filled with arrogance? against the creation of Allah Azza wa Jal and against the commands of Allah. Then your outward appearance must match your inward and your inward must also match your outward appearance. You know, Dua ul istiftah. So you've began the prayer. Now there is a dua that you say before you read Surah Al-Fatiha. And this dua, one of the dua is, وَجَّهْتُ وَجْهِيَ لِلَّذِي فَطَرَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ حَنِيفًا وَمَا أَنَا مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ إِنَّ صَلَاتِي وَنُسُكِي وَمَحْيَايَ وَمَمَاتِي لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ and, and this dua al-istiftah is a long one. But I just gave you a quarter of it. But the point is, this dua al-istiftah, you know what it says? It says, وَجَّهْتُ وَجْهِ لِلَّذِي فَطَرَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ حَنِيفًا You are saying, literally you're saying, Oh Allah, I have turned my face and my attention to the one who created the heavens and the earth, Hanifan. And I am inclined to a tawheed to Islam, far away from a shirk. And I am not from those who associate partners with Allah. Inna salati, verily my prayer, wa nusuki, and my rituals and my sacrifice, wa mahyay, my entire life and every moment in my life, wa mamati, and even my death is for Allah. Allahu Akbar. This is dua al-istiftah that you say. Tayyib, you said this dua. You said this dua. But is that the reality? Is that the reality? Have you really faced Allah Azza and given your attention to the one who created the heavens and the earth as you said? So al-ulama rahimahumullah, they said, um, not only the body is supposed to face the qibla, but your heart must face Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just like you cannot turn your body away from the qibla, you should not be turning your heart and your attention away from Allah azza wa jal. Because salat, dua al-istiftah, you just said, wajjahtu wajhi. I have turned my attention and my face and my body and my soul to the one who created the heavens and the earth. And then, what do we find out? That your heart is paying attention to something else. Your heart is thinking about something else in this worldly life. Your heart is rushing to something of this worldly life. Even now, you have not achieved honesty. Because your words don't uh, match. Don't match the state of your heart. As a result, you've lost honesty. My brothers and sisters in Islam understand this point. Understand this point. This is what honesty is. Whatever you're going to do on the outside must match your inside. If Allah is truly great and you said Allahu Akbar, then your heart must not be distracted with anything because Allah is greater than it. Right? And with all the other points as we mentioned, this is how we achieve honesty in our prayer. When you are praying, Allah, my brothers and sisters in Islam, when you are praying, Allah is responding to you. Allah is responding. 
Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, inna ahadakum idha qama yusalli, when any one of you gets up to pray, innama yunaji rabbah, he is having a secret, private conversation with Allah. فَلْيَنْظُرْ كَيْفَ يُنَاجِيهِ يعني, in other words, فَلْيَنْظُرْ كَيْفَ يُنَاجِيهِ How are you going to converse with Allah? Now that you know you're standing in conversation with Allah Azza wa Jal, how are you going to converse with Him? And how can you converse with Allah when a part of you is doing what is supposed to be done and your heart is being distracted and turned to somewhere else? Indeed, this is not honesty in Salat. My brothers and sisters in Islam, this is why it is prohibited as well that a person spit in front of him. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam forbid this. Why? Because Allah azza wa is in front of you. You are having a conversation with Allah azza wa jal. It's rude to spit. So this is a real conversation. For you need to be honest. And subhanallah, Allah azza wa has made it easy for us that your tongue is moving throughout the entire salat and it does not stop at all. Allahu Akbar. سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك وتبارك اسمك وتعالى جدك ولا إله غيرك بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ذن فاتحة ذن صورة الله أكبر سبحان ربي العظيم three times then الله سمع الله لي الحميدة ربنا ولك الحمد الله أكبر none stop your tongue is moving twin the entire time from the moment you say الله أكبر until you say السلام عليكم ورحمة الله you know what does that does it helps you it helps you remain focused in your salat and paying attention in your salat because you're moving your tongue the entire time. You're not stopping. Subhanallah. Very important to, to realize this. You know, I'm, I'm speaking to you now and I have been speaking non-stop for almost 47 minutes and I'm focused and paying attention. Why? Because I'm talking and you're the one who's listening. You haven't been talking all this time. So most definitely, some of you, might have lost some attention with me, even if it was for a minute or two or three minutes, because you're not talking. The one who is talking does not lose attention. How then when we pray, we lose attention? When Allah Azza wa Jal made for us the entire salat, a movement of the tongue that doesn't stop. Allahu Akbar, Wallahi, Wallahi, how rude. The people have not appreciated what Allah Azza wa Jal has given them. The people are robots now in their salat, and it's being prayed like a habit. You need to restart and remind yourself of these points that I'm telling you so that you can achieve this excellence in a salat my brothers and sisters in Islam honesty how do we achieve as we're on the second point right honesty which is the outward appearance matching your inward appearance I give you a tip how do you achieve this don't rush your prayer pay attention because when you rush something you don't pay attention when you take your time you begin to pay attention and you focus even if this attention came to you in the second rak'ah or in the third rak'ah, alhamdulillah, better. Better than this attention not coming all together. And I tell you how you do this. I tell you a secret, how you stop rushing your prayer. Listen, just increase, increase 30 seconds to 60 seconds for each movement of a salat. Yani don't you say Allahu Akbar standing? Your normal standing, add on it another 60 seconds or 30 seconds. Your ruku'ah, you see your ruku'ah? Just please, add 30 seconds to it. Sounds easy, 30 seconds. Oh, wallahi, it'll make a difference in your life. You come back up from ruku'ah, instead of five seconds, people get up. Instead of five seconds, make them 30 seconds. Make them 30 seconds. Yeah, and on your five seconds, add 25 seconds. Wallahi, you're going to notice a difference. And in your sujood, add, add, add 30 seconds. And when you come up from sujood, add five, 10 seconds. You go back in sujood, add. Get up for, add, add, add some time. Just seconds, I'm not telling you minutes. Seconds, just so you can notice a difference within this week now, this week that's coming, these 10 days of the hijjah At 10, 20 seconds for each movement of a salat, by the end of 10 days, you're going to realize a massive difference. Then begin to upgrade. Go up and increase one minute. Huh? And then you'll know how to deal with this on your own accord. Very important, very important to do this. 
You need to upgrade. You need to enhance your salat. You cannot stay praying the same prayer or praying my brothers and sisters in Islam. Upgrade, upgrade your salat. You know, people today, husband and wife, when they're married, they say you need to upgrade. You need to upgrade the relationship. So what that means is, uh, I don't know, go on a holiday, go somewhere, refresh, do new things, right? Because otherwise this relationship between you and your wife will get boring. Upgrade it every few months, do something exciting so you can keep this love and this motivation in this marriage going. Tayyab was salat, your relationship with the salat. You need to upgrade it so that your love for the salat remains. Upgrade, enhance, learn a new dhikr that is said in a ruku'ah, learn. Learn the complete dhikr that is said when you stand up after a ruku'ah. ربنا ولك الحمد حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه ملء السماوات وملء الأرض وملء أبا بينهما وملء ما شئت من شيء بعد أهل الثناء والمجد أحق ما قال العبد وكلنا لك عبد اللهم لا مانع لما أعطيت ولا معطي لما منعت ولا ينفع ذا الجد منك الجد This is the complete form of praise that is supposed to be said when you rise from a ركوع When you've already given up on yourself you will never look at this dhikr ever again until you die then we need to enhance our salat so our prayer can be honest, so we can achieve honesty with Allah Azza wa Jalla in our prayers. The feeling of honesty in salat is important, my brothers and sisters in Islam. Don't rush your prayer. Anyone who rushes the prayer will never achieve honesty in his salat. You'll dream you'll never get there because when you rush, you don't pay attention. And when you're not paying attention, you're not being true when you said Allahu Akbar. Remember Allah Akbar meant Allah is greater than everything. Show me. Show me how you believe Allah is greater than everything. When you rush to something, that means you've considered that thing great in your life and you need to rush to it as soon as possible. You're not being honest. My brothers and sisters in Islam also, when you pray the prayers on time, you're being honest. You're being honest. Why? Because you are preferring what Allah loves over what you love. And when you prefer what Allah loves over what you love, you've achieved honesty. Let's take an example. Salat al-Fajr time. Fajr time, the body loves to sleep. It loves to rest at that time, just like millions around the world are doing. But then as soon as you hear Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, you get up and you say, I'm going to pray Salat al-Fajr on time because Allah loves for me to pray it on time. And my body loves to sleep. But I will prefer what Allah loves over what I love. You've achieved honesty. Congratulations. Salat al-Dhuhr comes. Salat al-Dhuhr, people are busy in their work, money, making business deals, contracts, whatever it is. The, the disruptions of all the life. So you said, wait, 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 wait. I love to deal and make money and sell and sign contracts and meet people. I love to do this. Um, I love to go hang out with the boys, with the girls, whoever it is, yani, uh, drink a coffee at this time, dhuhr time, you know, but no, no, no. Okay, this is what I love to do. And Allah wants me to pray Salat al-Dhuhr. So I give up everything. And I pray Salat al-Dhuhr on time. Now, I am preferring what Allah loves over what I love. You see that? Come Salat al-Asr time. Everyone's tired. Everyone's busy. You just want to kick back on the couch, play with your phone and uh, read updates and whatever it is people do on their phones these days. But then you remember that Allah is calling me for Salat al-Asr. But I love to relax at Asr time. However, to be honest with Allah, I'm going to prefer what Allah loves. So I'm going to get up and make wudu and pray Salat al-Asr and I'm going to prefer this over what I love. And that is to sit on the couch and doing whatever you do to relax. And same thing goes for when Maghrib time comes and when Isha time comes. By the time Isha comes, your body just is shut down, wants to sleep and you want to relax and enjoy your, your sleep. But Allah wants you to pray. So you say, oh Allah, I love to sleep now. I'm tired, ya Allah, I'm I want to sleep now. But I know as well, ya Allah, you love from me that I pray Isha on time. So I'm going to prefer what you love over what I love. And I'm going to pray properly before I sleep. Allahu Akbar, congratulations. If that's your mindset and that's your attitude and behavior towards a salat, 
you have achieved honesty in the salat. Allahu Akbar, my brothers and sisters in Islam, there's a big point. Honesty in your prayer. So these are two. Al-Ikhlas, sincerity. And number two is honesty. We'll move on to the third point of how a person can um, reach the level of Qurratu Ayn. Allahu Akbar. Third point is, listen to this. Mashhadul Mutaba'ah. Mashhadul Mutaba'ah. The feeling of praying in the same manner Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prayed. Allahu Akbar. This is what we want. We want you to pray like how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prayed. This is the feeling you're supposed to have in your salat. That I am praying the prayer of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I am going to pray it exactly like how he prayed it. Allahu Akbar. You will feel close to the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As a result, you will feel close to Allah Azza wa Jal. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Sallu kama ra'aytumuni usalli. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Pray in the same manner you have seen me pray. Then the way we pray is what we saw of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and how he taught us. We are responsible for this. Everyone is responsible to learn to pray how Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prayed. We are responsible. On the day of judgment, Allah azza wa jal will ask, وَيَوْمَ يُنَادِيهِمْ فَيَقُولُوا مَاذَا أَجَبْتُمُ الْمُرْسَلِينَ this is a question from Allah on the day of judgment. Allah will gather the people and he will say to them, Mada ajabtumul mursaleen? How did you people respond to my prophets? How did you people respond to my messengers? Did you take their teachings in full and implement them in your life? Or you neglected and you ignored and you said someone else will do it on my behalf? Mm. How was your response to the messenger? Allah Azza wa Jalla says, "Fala nasalan al-ladina ursila ilayhim, wala nasalan al-mursalin." You will be questioned. The messengers will be questioned, and the followers will be questioned. You will be questioned. Did you pray in the same manner Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam taught you or not? Or it's just something like you saw your parents pray and you never enhanced your knowledge about the salat. Ya khwanna wallahi, it's a crime. It's a crime to neglect knowledge of a salat. Because a prayer is obligatory upon each and every single one of us. And the principle in Islam is that if a deed is obligatory, seeking its knowledge is obligatory. So we cannot neglect the teaching of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How many people around the world pray wrong? Because they did not make an effort to learn how to pray correctly. How? Wallahi, wallahi, they're in their thousands. There is not a masjid I have entered except that I see someone dressed in a wrong way. His aura is showing, for example, his back. You know, the common mistake of making ruku'ah. And then his shirt flies up and half his backside is showing. His aura is showing. Your prayer is invalid. Who's, who's responsible for this? Who? I? Me? Someone else? No one is responsible but you. Because you chose to remain ignorant and not learn your salat. My brothers and sisters in Islam, I mentioned this point about learning how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa prayed. But I won't leave the point hanging here. I will tell you this and direct you to a good source. Learning how to pray is a fiqhi matter. It's in the books of Islamic jurisprudence. There is an excellent book. Write this down. It is called Sifat Salat al-Nabi. Prophets Prayer Described. Prophets Prayer Described. It is a book made up of about uh, 170 pages. For Imam al-Albani rahimahullahu ta'ala and may Allah reward him for his effort. He wrote a beautiful, simple book in Arabic. 
He called it the prayer of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or more specifically, it's translated as Prophet's prayer described. Ya he purchase it, go and buy it and read it with your family. Read it once, twice, three times until you master how Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam prayed. Ya khwani, my brothers and sisters in Islam, look, even the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, even he was taught by Jibreel how to pray. You know, when Jibreel, uh, when the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was still in Mecca, Jibreel came and he led the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in prayer. He led him twice in prayer, all the prayers. And he said to him, this is how you pray. This is how you pray. And this is your prayer and the prayer of your ummah that comes after you. Even the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam learned how to pray. So, so how, how can you remain ignorant on the matter of as-salat? Go and buy yourself this book and read it and understand. And if you have questions, ask, ask, ask and learn how to pray. It's, sometimes it's upsetting. That the solution is there. Read a book. Ask your questions. At least the fundamentals, the obligations of your deen. Learn how to pray. So that you can experience Salat Rasulillah as you pray. And that way you are coming closer and closer in order to achieve Qurratu Ayn. You're coming closer to closer to having this experience that the prayer will be the coolness and the delight and the comfort of your eye. And you know, by the way, I just want to share one point here. Uh, it's probably a side note, um, and that is something concerning the prayer of a woman. And you know, there's always this debate, ongoing debate, just doesn't stop. And there's always questions about this. Does a woman have to cover her foot when she prays or not? We all know this matter. It always comes up from time to time. Yeah, my brothers and sisters in Islam, or more specifically, my sisters in Islam, listen and pay attention to what I'll say about this matter. And I'll say it once and I won't repeat it. Yani, al Jumhur, the majority of ulama, say that the entire body of a woman must be covered when she prays except her face and hands. So that means the majority opinion is that the foot must be covered. That's number one. Number two, which now gets serious, al-Madhab uh, al-Malikiyah, Madhab al-Malikiyah, the Maliki Madhab, and a Shafi'i Madhab, two giants of Islam, two big Madhab in Islam, they said their opinion is that if a woman prayed with her foot uncovered, then her prayer is invalid. Al-Malikiyah said that if she is still within the time of Salat, she must repeat her prayer while her foot is covered. Well, Imam al-Shafi'i also said the same thing. Yani, what I want to say now is, and I'm not here to debate the matter. Wallahi, I'm not here to debate the matter. I know there are opinions in where it is fine and no problems. A woman can pray with her foot uncovered. And that it does not invalidate her prayer and her prayer is correct. But I want to say this. We all know that the first matter that is questioned on the Day of Judgment is As-Salat. Since you know it's the first matter questioned and that the safest opinion is to cover your foot, it only takes two, three seconds to wear a socks. Then why? Why do you keep asking this question and avoiding this matter? Put your socks on and pray with peace. Right? I just wanted to mention this as a side point. If we know that the salat is the first thing that is questioned on the day of judgment, just go and pray correctly and just avoid the difference of opinion. Even though we respect the difference of opinion. Huh? And, if, and if a woman that is listening to me now has studied a sharia and her teacher has taught her that it is fine and it's permissible to pray without the foot being covered, and if that's what you learn and your prayer is correct and it's not invalid, I, I respect that. No problems. Continue. If this is what you believe, continue. No issue. But I'm just saying, 
The safer opinion, and what, what, the safer opinion is cover, since the salat is the first thing that is questioned. And add to that, two great imams in Islam mentioned that the prayer is invalid if the foot is uncovered. Allahu Akbar. Even, <clears throat> that is the third point, learning, feeling, feeling the salat of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And you know, I, I can mention a story here on this point, something beautiful, Allah, yani our teachers, ulama, rahimahumullah, have mentioned this story that happened between Sheikh Ibn Baz, rahimahullah, and Imam Al-Albani, Sheikh Al-Albani, rahimahullah, and Ibn Uthaymin, rahimahullah. Three contemporary Imams, giants in Islam. Uh, they were in Mina during the Hajj time, in Mina, and it was time for a salat Look at the humility, Allahu Akbar, among al ulama. Uh, so it was time for a salat and you have three ulama in one setting. Who's going to lead the prayer? Who's going to lead the prayer? So uh, they mentioned that uh, Sheikh Ibn Uthaymin should pray because he's the most knowledgeable concerning fiqh. So they said to him, go and pray, Imam. Then Sheikh Ibn Uthaymin refused, he refused. And he said, al Sheikh Al-Albani is more knowledgeable in the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because that was his speciality. He was, yani, he was, his knowledge was deep in Al-Hadith. So they agreed, Al-Imam Al-Albani is going to pray. So he stepped forward to pray. And then he looked back and he said to Sheikh Ibn Baz, should I pray, should I lead the people بهم صلاة رسول الله أم أخفف؟ he said to Sheikh Al Albani, he said to Sheikh Ibn Baz, should I lead the people and pray and pray the prayer of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or should I make the prayer light and easy? Allahu Akbar. A scholar is asking this other scholar. Is Sheikh Ibn Baz, he answered the Sheikh Al Albani, look at the humility, and he said to him, عَلِّمْنَا كَيْفَ صَلَاةَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ He said to him, teach us how did the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam pray. And it was an incredible salat that day. The people that narrate the story, they say it was an incredible salat that day. Yeah, and my brothers and sisters in Islam, we don't have to live in Hollywood to think something like this. Learn how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prayed and you will have the same experience that those who prayed on that day behind the Sheikh Al-Albani had. And then even better, you will pray as though you are praying behind Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What a beautiful prayer it was. Lakin, يعني, when you choose to remain ignorant, how, how is your salat going to enhance? How, how are you going to feel sweetness in your salat? How? لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله. May Allah Azza wa Jal teach us. May Allah Azza wa Jal make it easy for us to learn how to pray. My brothers and sisters in Islam, the fourth matter and the fourth life-changing point and the fourth feeling you're supposed to have in your heart when you pray is Mashhadul Ihsan. Mashhadul Ihsan. The feeling of excellence in Salat. What does this mean? My brothers and sisters in Islam, Al-Ihsan is a high level. It is higher than Islam and Iman. It is the highest level. Al-Ihsan. So much so that Allah Azza wa Jal said in the Quran, Wallahu yuhibbu al muhsinin Allah loves the muhsinin those who have reached the level of Ihsan. How do we achieve excellence? How do we achieve this feeling of excellence in our prayer? Very simple. The hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam comes to teach us this. When the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was asked, what is Ihsan? He said, أن تعبد الله كأنك تراه فإن لم تكن تراه فإنه يراك. إذن إحسان is two levels. One is to worship Allah as though you can see him. To worship Allah as though you can see him. Allahu Akbar. And the one who worships Allah as though he can see him with his heart. Such a person will pray out of love and passion and excitement. The second level of Ihsan is, فَإِن لَمْ تَكُنْ تَرَاهُ فَإِنَّهُ يَرَاكُ If you cannot see him, 
and you cannot have this feeling of seeing Allah with your heart, then the second level of Ihsan is to know and be certain that Allah can see you. And the one who worships Allah on the basis that Allah can see him, such a person worships Allah out of fear of Allah. You understand the hadith? Two levels. The highest level of Ihsan is to worship Allah as though you, you yourself can see him. Not Allah can see you, you know that. You're on another level. You're worshipping Allah as though you can see him. As though you have witnessed Allah. I mean, this, you know, the two testimonies of our Islam. What was the first word in them? Ashhadu. You know what Ashhadu means? Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. You know, they translated, I bear witness and testify. I bear witness. Ashhadu comes from the word shahida, to see something. To see something with your eyes. Yani we did not say, A'lamu an la ilaha illallah. Ayqinu an la ilaha illallah. We did not say that. We said, Ashhadu. You're saying, I bear witness with my own eyes that there is no Lord worthy of worship but Allah, as though you saw it. This is the kind of iman and certainty we have to have in our deen. So, uh, so that's the idea. And and ta'bud Allah ka'annaka tarah, as though you can see him. You have to worship Allah as though you can see him. Now you'll reach the level of excellence. My brothers and sisters in Islam, Yani, let me say something. When you pray, you're in a real meeting with Allah. This is why you cannot sit down during the prayer. وَقُومُوا لِلَّهِ قَانِتِينَ Get up. You cannot talk in a salat because you're seeing Allah with your heart. You're in a real meeting with Allah. This is why we're not allowed to sit in our salat for no reason. Your salat is invalid if you sat. We're not allowed to talk to anyone in our salat. You're not allowed to look left and right because Allah is in front of you. We're not allowed to eat and drink. You're not allowed to look up. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam warned that people should not look up otherwise Allah will take their sight. What, a, what an incredible warning. Why? Because you're not respecting the fact that Allah is in front of you. So what did we say? We said you're not allowed to sit when you're able to stand. You're not allowed to talk to anyone. You're not allowed to look left and right. You're not allowed to look up. You cannot eat. You cannot drink. If someone spoke to you, you cannot answer him. You cannot spit in front of you. That is a hadith. فَلَا يَبْسُقَنَّ تِلْقَاءَ وَجِهِ Do not spit in front of you. And if you have to spit, if there's film, then to your left, to your left or in your clothing and just take it away in this manner because Allah is in front of you. You cannot look left and right. لأن الحديث النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم he said that إن الله يأمركم بالصلاة Allah commanded you to pray فإذا صليتم فلا تلتفتوا When you pray, do not look around left and right. فإن الله ينصب وجهه لوجه عبده في صلاته ما لم يلتفت. That Allah Azza wa Jal faces his servant when the servant prays. So long as the servant does not turn left and right. If you turn left and right, Allah Azza wa Jal turns away from you. Allahu Akbar. Why? Why all of this? Why all of these restrictions in a salat? Allah is helping us realize the fact that we are in a conversation with Allah. So don't move, don't eat, don't drink, don't sit, don't look left and right, don't talk, don't respond to anyone. Don't spit in front of you. Don't look up. Add to this. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said in the hadith, إِذَا تَثَاءَبَ أَحَدُكُمْ وَفِي رِوَاتٍ فِي الصَّلَاةِ فَلْيَكْظِمْهُ مَا اسْتَطَاعَ فَإِنَّ الشَّيْطَانَ يَدْخُلْ Even when you want to yawn. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, if one of you wants to yawn and he's in salat, then suppress it as much as you can. Get rid of it, suppress it, wake up, hold, hold, yeah, wake yourself up, stop yawning in a salat. فَإِنَّ الشَّيْطَانَ يَدْخُلْ Because the shaytan would enter. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, 
يعني why 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 stop your yawning when it's a natural thing that because you are standing before Allah and it is rude like now now if two people if, if 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 a human being if you went to a job interview you'd be embarrassed to yawn in front of him oh ram what's next that's a human being and you're embarrassed to yawn in front of them how then in a salat how then in a salat do you dare to yawn for nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said suppress this yawning as best as you can allahu akbar wallahi alazim my brothers and sisters in islam all of these restrictions in a salat is because we are actually in a real conversation with allah ya hey, wallah we in a real conversation that's why i'm telling you mashhadu al ihsan the feeling of excellence you will only reach this when you actually believe it that you can see allah with your heart and acknowledge that allah is seeing you and that you're in a real meeting with allah you are talking to allah and guess what allah is responding as in the hadith of uh, rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam hadith qudsi allah azza wa jalla he said whenever the servant says alhamdulillah rabbil alamin allah responds to the servant and says hamidani abdi my servant has praised me then you say arrahman arrahim allah would say athna alayya abdi my servant has uh, over praised me malik yawmiddin allah would say majjadani abdi my servant has exalted me allahu akbar allah talks back and responds the only thing is we cannot hear it but we can see it remember in our hearts and we can feel it subhanallah this is mashhadu al ihsan my brothers and sisters in islam this mashhadu al ihsan is huge wallahi my brothers and sisters in islam when you know that you are in front of allah you are talking to allah and allah is responding wallahi when you know this with what attitude and heart and with what emotion will you now say alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin how are you going to say it after all this after now realizing the secret behind all these restrictions in a salat it's just so it can help you focus and pay attention to allah after you know all this how are you now going to say alhamdulillah rabbil alamin with what heart with what attitude with what emotion are you going to say alhamdulillah all praise belongs to allah eh hey, wallah you're going to remember everything allah has done for you and you're going to say alhamdulillah with what emotion and feeling are you going to say arrahman arrahim it's not going to be casual anymore you know your last salat how did you say alhamdulillah rabbil Allah alhamdulillah rabbil alamin rahman rahim and oh, I did not care about what it means why because you did not realize you're in a real conversation with Allah but when you start realizing this the way you say arrahman arrahim is going to be way different to how you said it in your previous prayers the way you're going to say maliki yawmiddin yes you are talking to the one who owns the day of judgment yes yeah wallah you're talking to him and he can hear you and then by the time you get to iyyaka na'bud you're going to feel a sense of power that oh allah i am alhamdulillah you gave me the opportunity for me to declare with the tongue you created iyyaka na'bud you alone we worship and i don't worship anyone besides you you're reaffirming your belief in allah with the word iyyaka na'bud and allah is hearing it allah is hearing it and allah is saying hadha li 'abdi wa li 'abdi ma sa'al allahu akbar even this is ihsan this is ihsan my brothers and sisters in islam to worship allah as though you can see him to believe that you are in an actual conversation with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala And as I told you all those restrictions and all what we have been forbidden in a salat is helping us remember that we are in an actual meeting with Allah. So in the same manner 
If you are speaking to your boss in an interview, job interview, or you're speaking with a king or a big leader or someone that's important, in the same manner, you will not turn left and right. You will not talk to someone else. You will not look up. You will not spit in front of you. In the same manner you do that to a human being, then do the same thing. And even better when you're standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what is the result of excellence? What is the result of ihsan? If you pray with this attitude and this feeling, what's the result? And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, as in the hadith of Ubaidah ibn al-Samit radiyallahu anhu, إِذَا أَحْسَنَ الرَّجُلُ الصَّلَاةِ فَأَتَمَّ رُكُعَهَا وَسُجُودَهَا قَالَتِ الصَّلَاةِ حَفِظَكَ اللَّهُ كَمَا حَفِظْتَنِي Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, إِذَا أَحْسَنَ الرَّجُلُ If a person was to perfect his salat, perfect his prayer, perfect it, فَأَتَمَّ رُكُعَهَا He perfected the ruku' and the sujood and the standing of the prayer and every aspect of the prayer. The prayer, after the prayer, the prayer would say, حَفِظَكَ اللَّهِ كَمَا حَفِظْتَنِي Your prayer will make a dua for you. It will say, Oh Allah, protect him in the same manner he protected me. Look after him in the same manner he looked after me. فَتُرْفَعَ Then the prayer is raised to Allah Azza wa Jal. وَإِذَا أَسَاءُ الصَّلَاةِ And if you ruined the prayer, if you ruined it, and you showed no excellence in your prayer, فَلَمْ يُتِمَّ رُكُوعَ And how is that done? You did not perfect the ruku'ah. Your ruku' was Allah Akbar سَمِعَ اللَّهُ لِمَنْ حَمِدَهُ وَلَا سُجُودَهَا And you did not perfect your sujood. You were like how Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam described the prayer of the munafiq, that he pecks at the ground just like a chicken pecks at the ground, meaning up and down, up and down, that's his salat. If you ruined your prayer, you did not achieve excellence in the standing, in a ruku' in a sujood, a salat, after you pray, a salat would say, ضَيَّعَكَ اللَّهُ كَمَا ضَيَّعْتَنِي May Allah... Ruin your affairs in the same manner. You ruined me. A salat makes a dua against such a person. Not only there, but then listen to what happens. فَتُلَفُّ كَمَا يُلَفُّ الثَّوْبُ الْخَلِقِ فَيُضْرَبُ بِهَا وَجْهُهُ And then your prayer is tied up. It's uh, wrapped. It's wrapped. Like how a ruined shirt is wrapped. And then it is thrown in your face. That's here. That is what you deserve for ruining a salat. It's like, didn't you respect the fact that you are standing before Allah? You didn't respect that fact. Here, take a salat in your face and it's thrown in your face. It's thrown in the face of the one who did not respect the fact that he is standing before Allah. Now, my brothers and sisters in Islam, the matter is serious. There's nothing harsh here. The matter is serious. If there's one thing you need to perfect in your life, is it's a salat, nothing else. Well, this is why when your salat is perfect, everything else in life falls in place. Wallah. Do you understand? Can you understand what I'm saying? Because when your salat is perfect, in the manner that I've described to you, and there's still two more points, imagine, imagine how good your affairs would be in the outside life now. So good, so good. And as I told you, my brothers and sisters in Islam, in this hadith now that I shared with you, it proves once again, not everyone who did the actions of salat is considered someone who prayed. Look at in the case of the one who did not show interest in his salat and did not perfect the ruku' and sujood and the standing. His prayer was thrown in his face. He did the actions of salat but he did not pray. He is not considered of those who prayed. The fifth feeling we're supposed to have is Mashhadul Minna. Allahu Akbar. Mashhadul Minna must be pumping in your heart before a salat. You need this. What is this? It's to feel and to realize that the prayer is a favor from Allah to you. It's Allah's gift to you. Allah guided you to as-salat. Not the other way around. It's not you. It's not your favor to Allah. No. Don't ever feel like that. It is not your favor to Allah. No. 
It is Allah's favor upon you. This is mashhadul minna. You must realize, when you realize this in a salat, you're a step closer to experiencing a salat as being qurratu aynin for you, as being the coolness and the delight of your eyes, just like it was for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Mashhadul minna. Al-Sahaba, the companions radiyallahu anhum, they used to sing a line of poetry. This line of poetry says, it means, had it not been for Allah, we would have never been guided and we would have never given in charity and we would have never prayed. Allahu Akbar. So a salat is Allah's gift upon you. It is Allah's favor upon you. Not your favor to Allah. Allah doesn't need your prayer. And the people of the paradise, when the believers enter the paradise, we ask Allah Azzawajal to make us from among them. They will say, and this is mentioned in Surah Al-A'raf, they will say, Alhamdulillahi alladhi hadana lihadha wa ma kunna linahtadiya lawla an hadana Allah. They will say, all praise belongs to Allah, the one who guided us to this, to this Jannah, to this paradise. Had it not been for Allah, we would have never been guided to this paradise and to Islam. Never ever would have been guided. Allah Azza wa Jal, he says in the Quran, يَمُنُّونَ عَلَيْكَ أَنْ أَسْلَمُوا قُلْ لَا تَمُنُّوا عَلَيَّ إِسْلَامَكُمْ بَلِ اللَّهِ يَمُنُّوا عَلَيْكُمْ أَنْ هَدَاكُمْ لِلْإِيمَانِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ Allah Azza wa Jal, he says at the end of Surah Al-Hujurat, they, the, the Bedouins, the Arabs that accepted Islam, they think they have done you, O Prophet of Allah, a favor by becoming Muslims. Say to them, respond. Do not consider your Islam a favor to me. It is not a favor to me. Rather, it is Allah who has done you a favor by guiding you to Iman. It is Allah who made you and gave you and guided you to this favor of Iman. Now, that's the reality. This is a mashhad. This is what you're supposed to feel in your salat as you pray. It's not by your power. It's not by your ability. It's not, and, and also it's not your favor to Allah. It is Allah's favor upon you. This is what Allah guided you to. Look at the uh, dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam. He said, Rabbana waj'alna muslimayni lak. Oh Allah, make me and my son Ismail submit to you because they know on their own accord they cannot it is Allah who makes them Muslims he said Ibrahim in his other dua Rabbi j'alni muqim as salat oh Allah enable me make me of those who pray then Ibrahim realizes that when he gets up to pray it's Allah's favor upon him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says وَمَا بِكُمْ مِنْ نِعْمَةٍ فَمِنَ اللَّهِ Every favor that you have been given, it is from Allah. And guidance is the greatest of blessings. As-salat is the greatest of blessings. Therefore, it came from Allah. And you know when you pray, you say, Surat al-lazina an'amta alayhim. Guide me to the path of those whom you bestowed your favor upon. Then you're reminding yourself in as-salat that as-salat is Allah's favor upon you. It's not you doing Allah a favor. Allah doesn't need your favor. Allah Azza wa Jal, he says in the Quran, وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ حَبَّبَ إِلَيْكُمُ الْإِيمَانِ وَزَيَّنَهُ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ It is Allah who made the love of Iman in your heart and he decorated it and beautified it in your heart. You must feel this in your heart as you pray. And it is so important to have this feeling alive in your prayer. What feeling? In brief, this is the feeling of it is Allah, the prayer is Allah's favor upon you. What's the benefit of that when you feel this? Number one, it prevents arrogance from developing inside your heart. When you know that it is Allah, that is Allah who favored and showered you with the blessing of a salat, you cannot develop arrogance in your heart anymore. What are you going to develop arrogance for? What? When you acknowledge it's Allah's favor upon you, you cannot develop arrogance anymore. So that's one thing. And the other benefit is it motivates you and it promotes you and it encourages you 
to continuously praise Allah Azza wa Jal. And you will never ever praise yourself ever again. You'll say, eh, Alhamdulillah, oh Allah, that you guided me to a salat and you made me from among a few that pray around the world. La ilaha illallah. And this is, uh, and this actually perfects a person's tawheed. This is perfects a person's tawheed. You will never achieve complete tawheed unless you acknowledge with your heart and with your tongue that it's Allah's favor upon you. As salat is Allah's favor upon you and that you have been guided to be from among those who pray. And you know from Allah's names is As samad As samad As samad means you need Allah, he doesn't need you. From his name is Al Ghani. He is the rich. He is the rich. Al Ghani means he doesn't need anyone because he is rich. Also from his names is Al Mughni, the enricher. Not only is rich, but he gives people from what from 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 his blessings, Subhanahu wa Taala. So uh, he doesn't need your worship. He's a samad. He doesn't need your worship. He's al ghani. He doesn't need your worship. You know it's strange sometimes when people they praise their salat, right? Allahu Akbar after the Fatiha. He's reading al ikhlas. He's reading a short surah quickly so he can rush the prayer and finish the prayer quick. And he did not realize when he said Allahu Samad that within a Samad there is a reason for why you shouldn't have rushed your prayer. لأن Samad means the one who's not in need of you and your worships. Is this the Salat you're going to give Allah? Allah doesn't need that. So you read Allahu Samad and within the word Samad if you only pondered over what you said you would have said and questioned yourself, why did I rush the prayer? If Allah is a samad, which means he doesn't need anything from us. He doesn't need this prayer right now. Why am I rushing it for? Why are you rushing your prayer? Do you think Allah needs it? Yahweh samad told you that he doesn't need it. Rather, you are in need of his mercy and acceptance. So pray the way he deserves. Subhanallah. <clears throat> Final and the sixth point on how to achieve the level of Qurratu Ayn and that is Mashhadu At-Taqseer What is that? Mashhadu At-Taqseer and that is to feel and acknowledge in your heart that you have many shortcomings in your prayer as a matter of fact all the worships that you do you have shortcomings in them and concerning the rights of Allah we have a lot of shortcomings and you need to feel this in your heart in order to achieve Qurratu Ayn in order for this prayer to be your Qurratu Ayn to be your delight and coolness and happiness of the eye you must feel and recognize and acknowledge in your heart that your prayer is full of shortcomings there is a lot of error and wrong in your prayer like even if you exerted all effort and you prayed the best salat in your life, you still must acknowledge there are shortcomings in this prayer. There is one second, perhaps, you lost attention. It could be, of course it could be. That, that one second, that one moment you lost attention, that's your shortcoming in your salat. You know, we are speaking about Allah's rights here. Who can dare to say, I gave Allah his rights in full? Who can dare after a prayer to say, yes, I prayed 100% according to what Allah wants from me. Who dares to do this? No one. So acknowledge from the very beginning and feel and realize from the big, very beginning of a salat that your prayer is full of shortcomings. Full of shortcomings. Like, wallahi, my brothers and sisters in Islam. Wallah, even if you spent an entire lifetime in sujood, from the moment you were born until the moment you died, you were in sujood, you did not raise your head up, you did not eat, you did not drink, you did not do anything at all. It's impossible, but let's say that happened. You would still have shortcomings concerning your worship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Khalas, end of story, we have shortcomings. This is why after as salat we say, Astaghfirullah. And the best version is to say, Astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayh. That's the best version. To say, Astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayh. 
And the short version is to say Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah three times. But the best is to say Astaghfirullah, Atubu Ilayh, Astaghfirullah, Atubu Ilayh, Astaghfirullah, Atubu Ilayh three times. Why? Because Astaghfirullah, you're seeking Allah's forgiveness from the shortcomings that took place in the Salat. And at the same time, wa atubu ilayh, you're announcing your tawbah and your return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do you realize this? That after every prayer, we say astaghfirullah. Why? Is it because of a sin we committed? No. We say astaghfirullah to patch the shortcomings and the errors that took place in our salat. In hope that Allah azza wa jal will polish our prayer and make it perfect 100%. So after the prayer, when you say Astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayh three times, you're supposed to realize that you are in need of Allah wiping away your sins and forgiving your shortcomings more than you are in need of reward and hasanat for this prayer. You're in need of Allah forgiving your shortcomings after this prayer more than you are in need of reward and hasanat for the prayer. That's what you're supposed to realize after as-salat. Allahu Akbar. And even, wallahi, my brothers and sisters in Islam, even if we prayed the way Allah wants, and it was 100%, let's say for argument's sake I'm saying, and let's say our prayer had no shortcomings whatsoever, then do you still deserve any reward? Do you think you deserve reward? No. You don't deserve any reward. Why? Because you're a slave of Allah. And a slave must obey his master. And he must be in service of his master. And a slave cannot ask for reward. That's not right. You cannot ask. It's not your right to ask your master, give me reward. Yani take a worldly example. Let's say there's a slave and he did work for his master. Right? A slave and he did work for the master. And then let's say the slave asked the master, can you give me some money for the service? What would people would label that slave as being insane and crazy? You're a slave. You have to be in service of your master. You cannot ask for reward and compensation. You cannot. Well, subhanAllah, in this worldly manner I gave you, in reality, the actual master and the slave, both of them are slaves to Allah Azza wa Jal. So now imagine, Allah Azza wa Jal is our master, he's our Rabb, and we are slaves of his. So as a slave, we don't have the right to say, Allah, give us reward. But you're a slave. Do the work of a slave. You're in service of your master. You should be worshipping Allah. And if the, if the master decides to give you reward that's not because you deserve it it's because he's being generous subhanahu wa ta'ala this is why the nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said none of you will enter the paradise see the, the paradise is a reward none of you will get the reward of allah and enter the paradise by his deeds and his actions none why because we're slaves and as a slave we're not supposed to ask for reward for our deeds. So none of you will enter the paradise because of your deeds. The good deeds that you did, they were the right of Allah. They were the right of your master. You had to do them. Not even the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as in the hadith. Then the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, إِلَّا أَن يَتَغَمَّدَنِ اللَّهُ بِرَحْمَةٍ مِّنْهُ وَفَضْلٍ Only if Allah was to encompass me with his mercy, with his grace, with his blessing, then I enter the paradise. And this is how we enter the paradise. By the generosity of Allah and his mercy, we enter the paradise. Not with our deeds. Because I told you and I repeat to you, our deeds, you have to do them for Allah. Because you're a slave. Shouldn't you think a slave just sits on the side and does nothing? You're a slave. Naam. Abdul lillah. So do what a slave is supposed to do for his master. And don't you dare ask or believe that you're entitled to some reward. Ask Allah reward humbly. And Allah will give you, not because you deserve it, but because he subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-kareem, he's the generous one. 
Now, my brothers and sisters in Islam, we're coming to the end of our lesson. These are the six points that we mentioned. <clears throat> Let me just conclude now. This is, my brothers and sisters in Islam, the true meaning of life. إِنَّ صَلَاتِي وَنُسُكِي وَمَحْيَايَ وَمَمَاتِي لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ That my prayer and my sacrifice, my rituals and my life and my death is all for Allah. Wallahi, my brothers and sisters in Islam, spend a lifetime learning how to pray. Spend a lifetime perfecting your salat, your prayer. Don't listen to people that tell you, we've prayed and we know how to pray. Give us a new topic. These are the words of a shaytan. Every single day we read the Quran, we read something concerning a salat. That's Allah's message to us. If our salat was in correct shape and in correct order, Wallahi, Allah Azza wa Jal will give us victory uh, around the world. Every inch of this earth will be under Muslim rule if we prayed correctly. Wallahi, and no doubt about this. But look at our prayer. Look what it has become. Our prayer today, Allah al Musta'an, Allah al Musta'an. Look at the people today. What occupies them today? Today, today, now, how many how many world tournaments are going on? There is soccer, there is UFC, there is tennis, there is the Tour de France, the cycling tournament. Uh, all of this, look how many Muslims are occupied with this rubbish. Following UFC, and who won, and who lost, uh, tennis following the entire tournament from the beginning to the end, celebrating the win of people we got no idea who they are and we have no relation with them whatsoever. And what did you benefit? What did you benefit from a tennis player winning? Did he give you something? What did you benefit? Your time went wasted like this. Instead of reading how to pray and learning how to pray, you wasted your time following a soccer tournament to see who wins the World Cup. How does that benefit you? How does it benefit you in your deen? I mean, not only in your deen. How does it benefit you in your worldly matters? How does it, does it make your life better? Does it enhance your job? Does it, and if it had a worldly benefit, or maybe. But when it doesn't have a worldly benefit, and it doesn't have a hereafter benefit, and it doesn't have a spiritual benefit, what are you wasting your time on? Heck, this is how shaitan reels us to the entertainment slowly, slowly without realizing where we could have spent this time learning about our salat and how to pray. And now worse off, these tournaments are happening in the sacred months. And then the next month is Muharram. Ya Ammi, these are sacred months, you need to be extra careful in them. Keep away from distractions. Keep away from entertainments. Whether they're halal or whatever, it'll keep away. At least respect the sacredness of the mouth. These are the best days to Allah. In the best days to Allah. You're sitting in front of a TV screen watching soccer. You have your eyes glued to a ball going from foot to foot. Or you have your eyes on a ball that's going from racket to racket. Or you have your eyes on a, on a bicycle that is moving up and down. Hey Insanity, wallah. A waste of time, wallah. Wallah it is. I, I'm not talking to you here about what's halal and what's haram. Yes, things are haram. If men are sitting and watching women tournaments, and watching the aura of women, and same applies to women, it, this becomes haram. But also it becomes haram, this entire entertainment becomes haram when it distracts a person from a salat. Yes, this thing that's called halal entertainment becomes haram if it is going to distract a person from his salat. And dhikrullah, Allah Azza wa Jal, he said, uh, لا تلهكم أموالكم ولا أولادكم عن ذكر الله ومن يفعل ذلك فأولئك هم الخاسرون الله عز وجل he said don't allow your wealth like worldly possession worldly matters soccer games and whatever it is worldly matters 
And don't allow your family to distract you from dhikrullah. Because if these things and entertainments and worldly manners distract you from dhikrullah, well, salat is dhikrullah, such people are the losers. Well, I, I didn't say, hey, this is Allah's word. This is Allah's word to us. I'm only sharing to you Allah's word and Allah's warning. So don't sit there and say, oh, I'm harsh. I am telling you the reality of Al-Quran. Don't waste your time on the expense of your deen. After you've finished your salat, after you've done your ibadat, and there is time for halal entertainment, then go and enjoy. No problems. But to watch a soccer game or a tournament during the time of a salat and you're delaying the salat because of this entertainment, this is haram, no doubt. This is consensus. The entire ummah of Islam would say to you it's haram. For my brothers and, Islam, my, my brothers and sisters in Islam, 10 days, the best days to Allah and they're supposed to be your best days. You know, some people can sit here and say, Wallah, the best day was the day I got married. The best day was the day when I became a mother, when I became a father, when Allah blessed me with a child. The best day is when I graduated from college or from school and I finished finally. The best day is when I got my first job or I bought my first car or I purchased my first house. You can say this is the best day. But the hadith is telling us that the best days should actually be these 10 days here. If these are your best days in life, Better than the day you got married. Better than the day you graduated. Better than the day you were given a child. These 10 days are the best days in your life. Then Allah Azza wa Jal has given you an opportunity to worship Him in the most beloved days to Him. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Akhwani, my brothers and sisters in Islam, wake up. Allahi, wake up. Be patient. Be patient with the worship of Allah. Be patient. Don't rush. As Allah says, worship him and remain patient upon his worship. Perfecting your salat is a difficult task. Wallahi it is. Allah said, it's big. Except those who have reached the level of khushu'ah. It is not big upon them. It is very easy upon them. طيب. You want to reach the level of khushu'ah. You want to reach the level of ihsan. You want to reach the level in where as salat becomes qurratu ayn, the coolness of your eye. You want that? How do you really think you're going to get that in one minute, in one second? Prove to Allah you're honest about your claim and that you want this. So be patient. Just like all good things in life come after your patient. Allah, this is only a rule we know about the worldly life. This is also a rule applied in our deen. All good things comes with patience. The sweetness of a salat comes with patience. Allah Azza wa Jalla said, "وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُلَنَا." Those who strive and struggle for us, and they put the maximum effort for our sake, Allah will guide them to His path, to the paradise. وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَمَعَ الْمُحْسِنِينَ and Allah with us al-muhsinin, meaning Allah declared. Those who remain patient and strive in their worship, he declared them as muhsineen. Haven't we been speaking about that? Reaching the level of ihsan in our salat. My brothers and sisters in Islam, this is the life. This is how it is. It's a few more days and we're all gone. What are people running after? What do people want? Why do people rush their worship? What are you running after? What is it? You know what people want? They want happiness. Everyone is in pursuit of happiness. Everyone wants just a peace of mind, comfort, and happiness. Isn't that true? Everyone wants this. If that was through money, then he'll work hard and he makes money so that this money could get him happiness. If it was marriage, then he'll get married and he's marrying in the intention that this wife or this husband is going to get them happiness. Everyone is after happiness. And where are you going to find happiness? Uqsimu billah wallahi. The one who looks for happiness, the one who looks for happiness and does not pray, pray will never find happiness. Let know he's looking in the wrong directions. The true happiness is in your relationship with Allah. And your relationship with Allah is your relationship with as salat wal quran The happiness is sought in these matters. 
فdon't be saying I'm looking for happiness while you're not praying. You will not find it. Don't run after the luxuries of this life and brand names and designer clothing and perfect, you know, brand name shoes like what's taken the people today by storm. Don't run after the luxuries of this life. Don't, don't run after them. They have been put in front of us as a fitna, wallah. They have been put in front of us as a fitna. I mean, you know how crazy people are. They make a lot of money. Then they spend it buying a designer shirt, which costs maybe three, four hundred dollars, and some brand shoes that cost them seven, eight hundred dollars. And then after a few months or a few years, it goes into the bin. Yeah, did you see this cycle? This is exactly what is meant when Allah Azza wa Jal said, dunya illa mata'ul ghurur, that this worldly life is only a deception. How is it a deception? This is how it's a deception. You work, 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 you make money, you spend it on something that won't last, and then you throw it in the bin. Wouldn't it have been wiser to buy something that covers your body, something, anything humble that covers your body? I'm not saying that brand and expensive clothing is haram. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying for the one who cannot afford it and puts himself in this kind of mess and financial difficulty and borrows money and so on to live a luxurious life on the expense of others and he distrust, wouldn't it have been easier for you to cover your body in simple clothing and use your money in something else that is productive? Allah Azza wa Jal, he said, وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَاكَ سَبْعًا مِنَ الْمَثَانِ we gave you Surah Al-Fatiha wal Quran Al-Azim and we gave you the Quran. Then Allah said, La Don't stretch your eyes to that which we have given them in this worldly life. Don't stretch your eyes out to the luxuries of this life. Why? Because we've given you the Quran. We've given you something that is better than the luxuries of this life. We've given you the Quran. We've given you Surah Al-Fatiha. We've given you As-Salat. Stretch your eyes to the Qur'an. Learn the Qur'an. The more you learn the meanings of the Qur'an, the more you'll find this kind of luxury in your life and happiness in your life. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, إِنَّ الدُّنْيَا حُلْوَةٌ خَضِرَةٌ وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ مُسْتَخْلِفُكُمْ فِيهَا فَيَنْظُرَ كَيْفَ تَعْمَلُونَ Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, this life is sweet and it's green. Sweet and it's green. You know, it tastes beautiful. Things in this life taste beautiful. And there is beautiful scenery in this life. There's beautiful landscape and mountains and rainfalls and greenery and so on. And you know, if something is sweet and beautiful and green, the eye seeks it and the heart seeks it. Uh, this is why Allah told us, don't stretch your eyes to the luxuries of this life. But when your heart, when your eye seeks something that is luxury, and your heart seeks it, that's when the human being falls in a trap. So when Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, that's how the world of life is. It's full of luxuries, full of beauties. And Allah Azza wa Jal will make you inhabitants of this life so that he can see how you behave. Allah is seeing how we behave. فَاتَّقُوا الدُّنْيَا وَاتَّقُوا النِّسَاءَ The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then said, Beware of this world and beware of women. Verily, the first trial of the children of Bani Israel was in women. Because of course, this is the greatest fitna. This is the greatest fitna that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam worried for his ummah after his death. فِتْنَةُ nisa, The fitna of women. So men are supposed to lower their gaze and women at the same time are supposed to dress up appropriately according to what Allah, their master, has commanded them to do. Now, subhanAllah, important hadith, finally, my brothers and sisters in Islam, and I'm just sharing this conclusion with you so you can be in perspective what this worldly life is really about. There is nothing to rush to. So concentrate in your prayer and take time in your salat. One last hadith, and this is the hadith of Utbah ibn Ghazwan. Radiyallahu anhu, he says, 
He did a khutbah in front of his companions. And I leave you with these words. He said to them, أما بعد فإن الدنيا قد آذنت بصرم وولت حذاء لم يبق منها إلا صبابة كصبابة الإناء يتصابها صاحبها وإنكم منتقلون منها إلى دار لا زوال لها فلتنقلوا بخير ما بحضرتكم الله أكبر عتبة ابن غزوان It's like he's saying farewelling words He said, oh people He said the world has given, the, has, the world has been given the news of its end and it's running to meet its end swiftly. Meaning this world is, it's coming to its end. خلاص, finished. Nothing is left of this worldly life except the very little amount of water that remains in a cup. You know, a cup, if you drink it and then you put it down and there's a little bit of water left, that's how much that's left of this worldly life. It's the hadith of uh, Utbah radiallahu anhu. Then he said, and you are all going to move to an abode which knows no end, meaning we're all going to the hereafter and there is no end. So this world is about to end and the next life doesn't know any end. There is no ending. Allahu Akbar. So he said, so everyone should proceed there Go there, go to the afterlife with good deeds. Pack up good deeds in your bag. Make sure your bag is well packed with good deeds, especially with your salat. And go to the afterlife with that baggage. Then this world is about to end and we're about to start a new life in where it does not end. It's either hellfire forever or the paradise forever. You make the choice, my brothers and sisters in Islam. Allah Azza wa has given us the intellect, the mind, and the ability to worship Him the way He deserves to be worshipped. And uh, make the most of your time and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala most importantly that He gives you the aid and the ability and the power and the strength that you worship Him until the day you meet Him. Pack up your bags, not for holidays. Don't do that on uh, primary. That's a, that's a secondary matter. Pack up your bags for the afterlife. What does a do? فَإِنَّ خَيْرَ الزَّادِ التَّقْوَى You know, today, the hujjaj people that are privileged, we ask Allah Azza wa Jal min fadlih, but the people that are going to hajj, they're packing their bags today, and they're heading out to al-hajj. And so we are supposed to also pack our bags, baggage of hasanat and good deeds. Now, 10 days, do as much as deeds as you can. Focus on your salat now. And after the 10 days and always and enhance your prayer, my brothers and sisters in Islam, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept from us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our shortcomings. And I ask Allah azza wa jal that he enhance our salat and that he make it our qurratu ayn. And we ask Allah azza wa jal that he accept our ruku' our sujood, our qiyam, our qira'ah. We ask Allah azza wa jal uh, that he uh, يعني, relieve the Muslims' pain all around the world and that he in, end their suffering and reward them for the calamities that they are going through. And we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to accept from us our deeds. Innahu liyu dhalika wal qadiru alayh wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifoon wa salamun ala al-mursaleen. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. وجزاكم الله خيرا والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته